Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you'll remember that back in program one, I set out four main goals to try and improve my own knowledge and awareness of the issues that we face in our climate and environment. Number one, understand more about the science of climate change. Number two, learn more about how each of us can adapt. Number three, investigate what our governments are doing about it. Number four, investigate new technologies that might help. The WTF board's been added to and amended along the way, and we've marked off quite a few of the main elements that are influencing or are influenced by our warming climate. We've also had a look at a few of the ideas you and I can implement in our own homes to help reduce our energy and water demand. Now it's fair to say that the conclusions from a lot of these programs have been a bit dire and depressing. We've clearly got a major climate crisis on our hands. No serious reputable researcher or scientist is in any doubt whatsoever about that. If anything, scientific conservatism with a small c and governmental pressure have combined to produce forecasts and predictions that most likely underplay the severity of what we face over the next few decades. So, Rather than disappearing down a rabbit hole of despondency and despair, I think it's time we took a look at the technological initiatives that either already exist or are coming online to help mitigate the worst effects of climate change. There's actually a massive amount of research and development going on around the world, mostly commercially funded, to find real solutions that will provide a sustainable future for complex life on this planet. So over the next few programmes, we'll be looking at everything from the electric vehicle revolution that's quietly ramping up right under our noses, all the way up to very ambitious proposals to harvest vast amounts of the kinetic and thermal energy that constantly circulates our planet in the oceans, and which just on its own could easily provide all the energy needs of our civilization hundreds of times over. So what about progress so far with the main two renewable technologies, solar and wind? Well. In 2017, China added an extra 52.8 gigawatts of solar power to their energy mix. Just as a reminder, a gigawatt is a million kilowatts or a billion watts. The United States added 11.8 gigawatts and India added 9.6 gigawatts. And these three countries alone accounted for three quarters of total global installations. Europe managed only 8.6 gigawatts. Solar power seems to be the glamour model of the renewables technology industry, I think mainly because of its accessibility to the domestic market, as I've looked at in a couple of other videos. But wind has been an essential source of power for human beings for thousands of years, and modern wind turbines have been developing in a serious commercial way since the early 1970s, mainly due to Denmark's visionary approach to continuous improvement and investment. Nowadays, of course, quite unsurprisingly, China also leads the way on this technology, with 19.5 gigawatts of additional capacity added in 2017, making up 37% of the total 52.6 gigawatts installed globally. So let's have a look at how this most simple and ancient energy source is translating into the modern age. There's a very simple and basic principle that applies to modern wind turbines. Bigger is better. There's two ways of achieving this. You can fit bigger blades and rotors so that they turn the turbine faster and generate more electricity. But as well as this, if you can get the turbines higher up in the air, where the wind tends to be blowing more constantly, then the blades will be turning more of the time and the turbine will be working at a rate that's closer to its maximum capacity. And that's definitely a good thing, not least from an economic point of view. Now obviously the higher you build a skinny tower with three massive rotating wings attached to it, the more stress you put on the materials. So lots of testing takes place, especially on the blades themselves. Here's the largest blade in the world being put through its paces at a test facility in Denmark. These blades are being pulled back and forth with a force described as the equivalent to the weight of approximately 16 African elephants. So then you need to think about where to put your turbines. We've all seen the onshore versions dotted around across the countryside. Some people love them and regard them as a thing of beauty in their own right. Some people hate them. Either way, all land-based turbines are limited in size by things like surrounding infrastructure, the shadows they cast over other properties, and also, very importantly, by things like bird migration and flight paths. Out at sea, though, no such limitations exist, so you can go as big as existing technologies will allow, and that means some real monsters are coming onto the market over the next few years. 
GE Renewable Energy recently announced that it will be investing $400 million in something called the Halliade X. When these things get installed in 2021, they will be the biggest, tallest and most powerful turbines in the world. To get an idea of scale, let's imagine a couple of tourists who've just landed a jumbo jet on a giant airfield in the middle of nowhere in particular. On the airfield are full-scale models of various well-known landmarks. To start us off, we'll have a look at a full-scale copy of the Statue of Liberty. At just over 92 metres high, it already dwarfs our plane and tourists. Then we arrive at an average-sized American onshore wind turbine. At 141 metres in height, it towers over the New York Monument. We've also got a full-scale model of the London Eye, which is a closer match at 135 metres. But next to this is the largest onshore wind turbine that the United States currently has to offer. At a whopping 574 feet, or 174 metres, it actually surpasses the 499 feet height restriction imposed by the US Federal Aviation Authority. So the company that built it had to do loads of extra paperwork in order to achieve special consent to build this giant. Now, of course, no self-respecting height comparison presentation would be complete without the Eiffel Tower. So here it is. Surely they haven't got anything to compete with that. It's enormous. Here's the real thing towering over Paris, dominating the skyline. Well, as I said before, once you get out into the sea and well out of sight of the landlubbers, you can really go to town. So now we finally arrive at a full-scale model of the Halliade X wind turbine, and it really is a goliath. With a total height of 853 feet, or 258 meters, each blade is 351 feet, or 106 meters in length. This spectacular feat of engineering will turn a 12 megawatt turbine which if placed in a typical North Sea location would produce enough energy to power 16,000 homes. And if a number of these were configured into a 750 megawatt wind farm, which is the plan, it'll be powering around 1 million homes across Europe. In fact, turbines of similar proportions are already being tested in the High Wind Park project off the coast of Scotland. This project has five floating wind turbines anchored and tethered to the seafloor, each producing six megawatts of power. And this test facility is able to provide energy to 20,000 UK homes. In his superb article on Halliade X for the online news site Vox.com, David Roberts notes, bigger turbines harvest more energy more steadily. The bigger they get, the less variable and more reliable they get, and the easier they are to integrate into the grid. The industry refers to this steady reliability as capacity factor. Nuclear power, when operating constantly, has a capacity factor of over 90%. Natural gas in the US has a capacity factor of about 55%. Wind turbines from the early 2000s had a capacity factor of around 25 to 30. And an average modern onshore turbine today has a factor of about 43%. But this new breed of offshore behemoths are achieving capacity factors of up to 65%, which is such a consistent, steady, reliable stream of power that it can almost be regarded as a baseload energy source similar to nuclear. And that means less backup resources required to cover outages, which means the overall cost keeps going down. So turbines like the Halliade X, according to David Roberts, would be more valuable even if the price of wind electricity stayed the same. But David points out that the prices won't stay the same. They've actually dropped 65% since 2009. And a recent report by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US projected that innovation in wind power technology could drive it down another 50% by 2030. As a final look to the future, let's go back to our two tourists at the anonymous airfield one last time, where they seem to have made their way to the entrance of the Empire State Building because researchers at the University of Virginia are working on a design for an offshore turbine that will reach the almost inconceivable height of 1,640 feet, or just under 500 meters. And that's even higher than a world-famous landmark that was for a long time the tallest building in the world. Roberts concludes with this thought. Say new US wind turbines reach an average hub height of 460 feet or 140 meters by 2025, which is roughly in line with current projections. According to NREL data, such turbines could hit capacity factors of 60 plus percent 
across more than 750,000 square miles of US territory and 50 plus percent across 1.16 million square miles. That much wind at that capacity factor with foreseeable advances in wind tech will provide power cheap enough to absolutely crush all competitors and 2025 isn't that far away. So it looks like a very bright future for wind and solar, but many other new innovations are being developed to sit alongside these well-established technologies. And an integrated smart grid is being rapidly rolled out across Europe just in time to maximize the potential of the 50 million mobile storage units known as electric vehicles that will be on our roads by 2025. More about that revolution coming up in next week's programme. That's it for now though. Please do subscribe to the channel if you enjoy watching the programmes. It's completely free to subscribe and obviously the more subscribers we get, the more we get noticed by the YouTube search algorithms and the more chance we have of getting the message to as many people as possible about the positive actions each of us can take to mitigate and adapt to climate change. You can get to that link by clicking on the icon here and don't forget to hit the notification bell so you get updated when new shows come out. As always, thank you very much for watching, have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.